One of my favorite stories about the life of the Episcopal Church, a church that has traditionally welcomed, as the prayer book says, all sorts and conditions, regardless of age, race, economic status, education. If you were in the neighborhood and you lived near an Episcopal Church, you were welcome. To me, that's actually the Episcopal Church at its best. And this man and his family have been taken in as immigrants into this country. This was up in the Northeast of the New York area. And they literally came with the clothes on their back. They had nothing. And they were taken in by the church and they were, this family actually wound up living uh, in the rectory, which is, is true, some of you know, in some of the old Northeast churches, they had these big houses that were the rectory. And you know, one man, a smart family, doesn't even come close to you know, filling the place. So this family lived with them. And as I said, they had very, very little. And initially, the boy, this man, tells the story as a boy, he, he didn't even have money enough to be able to have good shoes. There were holes in his shoes. And he was very ashamed that he had holes in his shoes, especially on a Sunday morning when people came all dressed the way they did. And so his desire above all was to be an acolyte. And the reason he wanted to be an acolyte was because the robe would go down to the floor and cover the tops of his shoes so he could participate in the procession and no one would notice. No one would see, you see, his shoes. There's a reason that man became a priest. Because he got the gospel in a way. Have you wondered why it is that when we gather, we have all of these vestments on? It really is for two, and I think very important reasons. One, it is in fact meant to call us as leaders to take a back seat. We're not there to present ourselves. We're there to fulfill a role, to fulfill a job. And the vestments designate the nature of the job. And what we do in that job, whether that be lay reader, acolyte, choir member, deacon, priest, bishop, is actually more important than our accomplishments or lack thereof out there in the world. These vestments are meant to say, you're here to fulfill an office, a very specific and particular responsibility. And so at one level, it actually doesn't matter a lot what you wear underneath your robes. Although I've known some to take some advantage of that. <laughs> Particularly when the weather is extremely hot. Um, and the other is to be able to give a very clear message to the congregation that we're here to serve a very specific purpose. And it's actually not meant to call attention to ourselves. But we're here to serve together and live together and the roles are meant, the robes are meant to in fact set a pace to be able to say to people that whether you are in your Sunday best or whether you're like that boy who has holes in his shoes, you're just as important as anybody else. You're included because what matters is Jesus, not your socioeconomic status. But to enter into that means you're acknowledging something that's really important about who's in charge. In other words, the standards that we set for behavior and for life together come from Jesus, not from the society around us. That's one of the implications of having robes, you see, and declaring that what's important is who you are, not how much money you make. And so that gets us right into the story today, actually a pretty frightening story, of this parable of the wedding banquet. You need to understand, kings in that era were just like the president, prime minister of North Korea. People were terrified. They always did precisely what he said upon pain of death. There was no negotiation. So it was no shock to any of the people at all when they heard the story that when the king sent out an invitation to go to the banquet and people refused, they were killed. That would have caused no shock among his audience whatsoever. Because you see, to be invited into the king's house and to not show up is an act of treason. 
It's not just a question of inconvenience. And so actually it says something about the weak political nature of the king that they thought they could say no and get away with it. As it turned out, that was not true. But because no one would ever have refused an invitation from the king because of the consequences. Whether they liked the king or not actually had nothing to do with it. If they wanted to keep their lives and stay in the good graces of this despot, they did exactly and always what the king said. And so no one is surprised in the audience when those who were initially invited were killed. But then the king does something very unusual that causes them to wonder whether they're talking about a local despot. The king says, I want anybody to come to this man. I don't care who you are. Go out in, you know the story, into the highways and byways and invite the rich and the poor, anybody who could come. I want this, I've made all this food. I want my banquet to be completely full of people. And that's, of course, exactly what happens. Now, we need to be let in on something that is important later. That given the fact that everybody was invited, they're always given some sort of dress memento for the occasion. The thing that is called later the wedding garment. In other words, a part of being included, and again, a part of being included no matter who you are, even if you have holes in your shoes, is that you're, you're wearing something that says that you are a full-fledged invited member. There's not the rich section over here and the poor section over there. Everybody gets included. And so you can imagine how stunned the king is when after all of the guests are assembled, he makes his entrance into the hall Everybody, of course, stands in attention. They are quiet. And he's looking over this great sea of guests. And one man stands out in particular. He's not dressed in a way that he could have been. Because the porters who let everyone in would have made sure that everyone who came in had the appropriate dress for the occasion. And this man is not. And notice what the king does. He walks directly over to the man. And he, he says to him, friend. In other words, he's assuming the best. Was there some misunderstanding? Did they actually run out of robes to give out to everyone? I mean, he does not assume anything bad on the part of this one at all who does not have on the garment. But when he asks him, why don't you have on the wedding garment? And the man is speechless. He knows something is going on. It's not the fault of his porters. This man chose, you see, to stride into the banquet hall itself of the king, refusing to wear what the king asked of his guests. It is, in fact, a self-serving, arrogant expression of almost sedition. So what does the king say? This does not honor him, nor does it honor his fellow guests. Take this man and bind him up and throw him out. And there's an apocalyptic end of time edition that says, in essence, it's not just binding. He said, but throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Few actually step up to say yes fully. What's the implication? The implication is, is that God invites all people, no matter who they are. It is of secondary importance to the king of all kings and the lord of all lords about our worldly accomplishments. Family background, education, financial stability, all of those things, things which are extraordinarily important to us. But what happens instead and what the king shows us is most important is that we, in essence, come into the banquet hall on the king's terms. 
not our terms. And that to come into the banquet hall insisting on our terms rather than the king's terms is actually an act of treason. It's sedition. There's no kind way to put it. Either we come into the banquet hall and we choose to be, as it were, there on the king's terms, or we actually don't belong. Even though we've actually gotten an invitation, we can wave the invitation that we have received in the mail as long as we like. See, I actually really belong. The king has included me. But if we're not there in the hall according to the king's designation and according to his terms, the piece of paper means nothing because the one who invites us can abrogate his own invitation. Am I being clear? <laughs> so the implication, you see, is to be a part of the Christian life, to say yes to the invitation of our Lord, to come and to be a part of this great, enormous gathering, the very heavenly banquet of our God, invited into a place where no matter where we've been or what we've done or where we've come from, we can be forgiven and included and God makes room for us and there is no designation in the kingdom of God between rich and poor and economically advantaged or disadvantaged, between educated and uneducated. What matters is our loyalty, our loyalty, and our willingness to live under his authority and according to his terms. Otherwise, we can be very much in the position of expecting or assuming that we are fully included in the very household of God. And yet because we're living life according to our terms rather than his, he may stand before us at the judgment and say, I never knew you. There is scripture after scripture after scripture. And believe me, if I had the time, I would go through them to reinforce this point that while the grace of God invites all of us no matter who we have done and the forgiveness is deep and profound it cleanses us from all sin we are fully invited we are still not without obligation to do what we can to live under the terms of the king in this life in other words forgiveness mercy is never an excuse for rebellion it's instead an answer to rebellion and that's a very important distinction. I can come to God all I want and say, God, I really need your help with this. There is a broken, rebellious part of my life. <laughs> I may have the wedding garment on, but underneath the wedding garment is still a heart that wants to do what he wants to do. And because God is the one before whom all hearts are open, he understands that completely. He, he is more than willing to meet with us in the crucible of our own even tendencies to inner destruction. There is nothing inside of us that is too big for God. But that's very different than saying, I want what I want. I want the church to do what I want to do because I have a right to be able to say so. I want people to understand what is important to me, and I want them to do what I ask. You see, that doesn't look like Jesus. And what God is committed to doing is working within us the nature of Jesus, winsome, strong, humble, full of joy and laughter, deep and profound compassion, a life well lived, the abundant life that Jesus describes has no place for me wanting to live life on my terms. We live in a culture that says, in fact, you have a right to live life on your terms. And in fact, that's exactly what you should do. Jesus says, absolutely not. It is the way of destruction. <coughs> Can you not understand? So what we're doing as we gather together in the name of Jesus and pour ourselves into the scripture and kneel before him in mercy and receive the undeserved grace of bread and wine is completely contrary to the very voices that you hear on Good Morning America. 
and any other show that you can think of where what is exalted is personal accomplishment in a way that actually degrades humility. It is a point of pride. We need to understand that what we're doing is living in a way and calling one another to live in a way that is directly contrary to the, what the President of the United States says and does and many of the people who serve him. Do you hear me? We are not the same. We are meant, and Paul calls us this, aliens. We are strangers. We are part of the family of God that makes us very, very different from the world. And whenever the world's efforts to try to somehow get the control and make things go the way I want them to, in the, and particularly within the church, it's just noxious. It doesn't look like Jesus. And, and if we do not express ourselves to collectively together, and the, if we do not treat each other in a way that looks like Jesus, we have nothing to offer. Amen. Nothing. There's no blessing from God on a church that continues to exhibit power politics, preferences for the rich, kingpins in the in who sit in the pews and tell other people what to do. It should not be so. Why? <laughs> because it doesn't look like Jesus. And what Jesus wants is a people who are saying, above all else, all else, even my way, God says, I want a church that looks like my son. That reflects his sacrifice, his servitude, his compassion, his kindness, his great generosity. And that's the church that God blesses with conversions and miracles and extraordinary stories about how the mercy of God came yet again to another undeserving, disqualified person in the eyes of the world, and yet the Lord says, you belong to me. And he uses such humble, spirit-filled, biblically-informed people to literally mediate that message in a way that changes lives. Anything other than that is wood, hay, and stubble, to quote Paul. Wood, hay, and stubble. Those are the values that matter to Jesus. And particularly here, St. Mark's. You know who Mark is? Mark's a man of action. And his gospel is a man of action. The, the, the key adverb of the gospel of Mark is the word immediately. And it means Jesus immediately goes and does this. And then goes and does. I mean, if you read the gospel straight through, you have to sort of say, calm down, buddy. <laughs> It's like Jesus is on speed. It's like Mark does everything he can within 16 very tight chapters to communicate the breadth of a three-year life in ministry. It's almost overwhelming. But the point Mark is trying to make in making that his emphasis is that Jesus, above all, was a man of action. And he wouldn't let anything stand in the way of him obeying the voice of God, even at the price of his own life. <laughs> That's what a Markan church, in some ways, is meant to look like, to express that portion of the life of Jesus in very clear and concrete ways. To be a place that understands, if you want to be a part of this church, and if we're going to be true to our patron, St. Mark, then we better get at it. And, and this is important, if we're going to operate as people of action, that means the caliber of our relationships with one another have to be as clean as possible. Because when you're out there serving, it is tough work. And it's very easy to turn and get angry and to blame somebody else and go off on my own way. Because, you know, the heat in the kitchen is a lot hotter than normal life. And that's where the action is. And so it presumes a level of kindness, honesty, and trustworthiness, gentleness, and sacrifice that allows us to live into those relationships so that when we get out there and serve, I know who's on my right and my left, and I can count on that. 
My wife and I recently went out to help get our son settled in San Francisco, California. And we went to the church that he had picked. Little church plant. The rector had a couple, was the only part full-timer. They had a couple of part-time assistants who had other jobs. I mean, they were excited to have 60 people on a Sunday morning. And they were meeting in an office space that they had converted into a worship center. I couldn't tell you how deeply I was fed and nurtured by that service. And why? Because the value they held up that was literally embodied in their people was a sense of humble joy that was healing. I wrote the rector after I left and I said, it was refreshing. It was like being in an oasis in the midst of a very proud city. You see, it looks like Jesus when people walk and act and talk like that. And that's what the world longs for. It doesn't need another church that just sort of looks like everybody else and says, oh yeah, I know what goes on in there. No, 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 they want, they want people who will love them as they are, who will hear the wounds of their hearts, who will do something about it when they get in trouble. Come and I'll stand alongside of you. We're in this one together. A church that's known in the community as servants of God. As you go through this transition, giving thanks for the life of Christopher and Genevieve, who, in my opinion, have exhibited in a way that is almost unparalleled, Amen. a level of financial sacrifice, servanthood of time, clarity of witness, and just the joy of Jesus yeah. in them and between them. It's, it's an honor to call both of you our friends. I want to say to you that as you wrestle and pray about the future together, think about what it means to be the Church of St. Mark. Unless you want to change the name. <laughs> And see what humility and genuine sacrifice and choosing to serve together really could look like for a Haines City community that deeply needs a church that not only embodies every tribe, tongue, language, people, and nation, but actually like each other. And exhibit that kind of love in a community that continues to be profoundly divided. People. You have a mission field here. And I want to do all that I can to support you. Because what you're doing and the vocation that you have in this, in this community is extraordinarily important. There are plenty of churches in this community the other, others that are actually defined primarily by class, by socioeconomic standards, and by race. This church has dared dare to say that is not Jesus. How can we live out our life together? So please family, this is a fresh beginning even as it is a very strong and sad goodbye. You have a legacy in front of you, not just behind you. And I would urge be not those who look great but actually don't have the wedding garment. We still want to live life on their terms, not on the terms of Jesus. Not only for the sake of your own eternal soul, but the sake of a community that needs people to stand together, not divided, and serving in a way that causes other people to come to Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, your love for us is wide and deep and long. Your grace is more than we could ever imagine. Your forgiveness is unparalleled. And so we begin by saying how grateful we are to you that you've welcomed us and included us. Though our hearts are rebellious, our necks are stiff, 
and there is still within us the desire to have our own way. And yet you've invited us in, and you are working within us and around us to make us more and more like your Son. Help us, God, not to take advantage of your mercy, but to lean into it in a way that changes us and equips us to love each other and to love and serve a community that needs a witness for Christ. May we be men and women who not only have been called, but chosen, who take up the wedding garment and who say yes to you and to your service. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.